Welcome back to the Capital Mindset Show, guys. We're your hosts, Austin and Fabio. And today we have a preliminary analysis on Curate. It's an online retail business. And today we're going to be kind of exploring it in the model. First and foremost, we're going to kind of be exploring what the business is, as well as some other things that Fabio has potentially found. But so now- Before we begin, Austin, I want yes. to mention to everyone that this is a subscriber request. And if you guys want to submit a subscriber request, the best way to do that actually is via email. And we're going to be doing, yes. uh, well, it's actually through our website down here. Yes. So it's it's the contact form on our website. So if you scroll all the way down to where it says contact us, and then you put in your name, your email, and then the stock that you would like us to analyze, um, do bear in mind, we are not registered nor licensed financial advisors. So we will not be offering financial advice. But with that, let's kind of jump into this. So Fabio, to kind of show right here, what I found in the model is basically, I was kind of playing with the stock a little bit in the model myself. And as most of you may know, I'm actually relatively new to investing. So I am an accountant, but I'm an accountant coming over to the investment side for the first time ever. And I started investing a couple of months ago. And when I first started to invest, I was really serious about just taking financial data and then basing my entire investment thesis off of that, whether or not I would invest into this company or not. However, and it's something that Fabio always harps on. And one of the first lessons that he gave me that's really stuck with me to this point. And it's really the fact that it's a very basic lesson, but it takes a while until you fully grasp it. And it's that investing is a multi-layered cake. So financials are just one part of your overall investment thesis. There's law, there's macroeconomics, microeconomics, sentiment, you know, like, way the, like the way the market's moving, consumer sentiment, consumer trends, et cetera, and so forth. So that really is what we're doing here a capital mindset because we see people, we see people a lot actually on YouTube just basing an entire investment thesis off of the financials and the financials only. I'm not saying using the financials is a bad thing, of course. Like I would hope I'm not saying that, Fabio, right? <laughs> oh, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, what I'm what I'm saying is they need to be used in tandem with all of these other things to form a cohesive and very good investment thesis. So now something here, and this is actually the first example I really want to illustrate here. So this stock curate ticker symbol Q R T E A. I uh, plugged in my required rate of return of um, just 10%. And then I added a 300% margin of safety, bringing my discount rate to 40%. I assumed no share buybacks. And then even at a growth rate of 2% in cash flows, in cash flows, cash flows, a 2% two, uh, two growth rate, the stock came out as a buy at $11.30. So now, and actually, the um, subscriber who actually requested this actually noted this in his comment to us too, Fabio. He was like, this stock looks incredibly cheap, but he's smart. And here's why he's smart. Because sometimes in this instance here, this is a prime example of this. Sometimes in these sorts of instances, if it seems too good to be true, it might be too good to be true. And so now kind of exploring that with you, Fabio, what were some things that you found about this business and maybe some of the reasons why you're not so excited despite the model showing you this absolute incredible buy price with uh, allowing for a huge room for your assumptions to go wrong and you still to come out profitable here? So basically, I think the first thing we need to do is um, figure out what does this business do? And we're kind of doing this video more or less kind of raw because this is the preliminary analysis. So yeah. what we need to understand here is what Austin is showing us there on the model or what he showed us there on the model is uh, how cheaply priced this entity is, right? So that's the stock. That's what the equity is trading at. Now let's understand maybe why that's the case. So I will point to, for example, this company being the leader in televised sales. Okay, so what does that mean? So basically, when you see uh, these uh, TV shows, or you, you might see some advertisements from them, or you might see those TV shows where you, you uh, bid for products, right? So they sell primarily through the channels of TV. And in the past, that was a huge uh, market. And as we all know, what's been going on more recently in the past decade, Austin, with uh, what there, there's a word for it. It's called cord. I don't know, Fabio, tell me. Cord cutting, <laughs> cord cutting ah, right? Okay. So people had TVs and, well, not, not the, pro, the device, the TV, but, you know, like direct TV, for example. 
And then they said, well, why am I paying this amount of money when I just pretty much can get all my content through Netflix, Disney Plus, et cetera. So a lot of people have been switching over and just foregoing the advertisements on TVs, right? And instead uh, opting for a direct-to-consumer model, which is why those models have been growing tremendously over time. But the TV, uh, the, t- the standard TV model has been decreasing or in decline. Mm-hmm. So a question here, and I assume that you'll probably you're probably going to cover this soon. But yeah. how is this specific business structuring its current business model to potentially um, adapt to this change in consumer preferences? Which is exactly what we were noting is an element of the multi layered cake. How is this business adapting to change to those consumer preferences? Are they getting into a space? like those direct to consumer subscription sales or is that just something that would not exactly work with their current business model and then even if they're not doing anything what are some potential things they might be able to do to capitalize on this moving consumer preference towards more of these direct to consumer subscription models fabio yeah so the one that the one that is their traditional business is actually more like qv it's called qvc inc which is wholly owned by them and i'll share that on the screen now to kind of go over their different businesses and this is on their website so this is where actually you can find all this information and on the right we can see the the percentage the percentage uh, ownership of um, each of these businesses. And then here is a brief description about each business. So uh, you can see that some of them, they don't own the full amount. And that's, for example, Comstore. And you can see what this is. It's an ana- analytics company, right? Uh, and then here they have Cornerstone Brands, which you may or may not be familiar with. But this is the one I was talking about before. This is a huge portion of their business currently. And they highlight that in their income statement. Um, it, it, I believe it's still the largest individual sector of their um, income statement. So um, when we look at Zulili, Zulili, um, this is actually what you are thinking about when you think direct to consumer or competing with the likes of Amazon or other online retail uh, platforms. But, however, as an investor, I actually haven't heard of Zulili ever in my life. I've never shopped there. I've never used their, their platform personally, but there may be some of you watching that may have, and maybe you can comment down below about your experience there. But knowing that, that I may have some sort of um, anecdotal bias towards Zulili in a negative light because I haven't heard of them. So, the, so that tells me in, in my, for anecdotal evidence, I don't think that they're going to have a uh, very good penetration in the online retail market. They might. And if they do, the stock is 100% not priced for that. Um, so we have, to, uh, we have to remember that, okay? And then looks like here, they have a venture capital arm that invests in Israeli technology companies. Uh, so that, again, these are like call options. So we don't know how successful that will be. We're pretty much just... Um, looking at a holding company with a bunch of different pieces where the majority of their income does come from QVC. Okay. So QVC is a declining business. Um, It should, it's in a declining market. They are the leader in a declining market. So we don't know if any of these other things will actually play out, but if they do, I I can tell you that the stock is definitely not priced for that um, improvement. Of course we are, um, we are making assumptions that there will be some success somewhere, but think of it like a call option. All right. So Austin, can you take us right back to the model? Cause I want to ask you some questions to see mm-hmm. what we can find. And I want you to take us to the ratio sheet. The key so we ratio can, is my favorite here. So right here, I want to see, okay, the current ratio, they, they had a moment in 2020 when they went under, but they probably had enough cash flows to cover that. Uh, mm-hmm. So the current ratio looks okay. Cash ratio decent then the solvency ratios these are getting worse Mm -hmm. across the board yep they're getting worse so they're taking on debt and i assume because we were looking at the summary page they're buying back shares they might be buying back shares utilizing debt or they're just using their cash flows to buy back shares and then in order to invest in the business further they're taking on more debt regardless they are taking on more debt Mm -hmm. um Gross profit margins have remained stable. Actually, if you look, yeah, 2017 and 2021, they are back to the same. But we see a decrease in operating margins. So they're spending more on the operations, but an improvement from 2018, 2019. 
So we want to make sure that that's not a fluke because we know what happened in 2020 and that yeah. made people stay home more. So remember a lot of their businesses from what we saw are not uh, re- uh, customer facing retail. So we want to be cognizant of that. Net profit margin looks like that one is declining. That's a negative sign. Okay. That's probably maybe why they're so cheap. Uh, something maybe happened in between 2017, 2019, but 2020 again, fluke, maybe a fluke year. Return on assets is fantastic. Um, that's, that's actually really good. And return on equity is also really good. Uh, so positives there. Now let's go to earnings quality, our, our uh, unique metric here on capital mindset. So earnings mm-hmm. quality, terrible, not good. That's not a good sign. So uh, Fabio, can you, can you kind of explain for maybe some of our new viewers what earnings quality is and why we specifically like to place emphasis and then how that also relates to towards our discounted cash flow model, Fabio? So earnings quality um, actually should, should well, I'm looking at there that the model's actually kind of making a little bit of a fluke. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But earnings quality here is basically a unique metric that we utilize to kind of grade management in terms of how they're not managing the numbers, but um, how they're presenting the numbers or how gap is reflecting um, the, the true operations of a business over time. So earnings quality of a single year doesn't do it justice. You have, well, we have to measure it over across time. And that will tell us more or less uh, if management is doing a good job of representing the numbers utilizing GAP because GAP does allow for some flexibility. Um, and that flexibility can be negative in the short term, but over the long term, it, it all will play out the same, okay? So we just use that measure to kind of smooth things out to tell us, okay, well, not that management is managing the numbers, okay, because that's actually illegal. um, And I don't want to assume that management is doing that, but it does tell us whether or not um, something is going on in that uh, vicinity where something it's being affected in a negative light. So right here, uh, we want it to be getting higher and it is, uh, it's higher than 2017. Um, however, I think Austin, there, there may be a fluke in, in when, when you, uh, added something, mm-hmm. I'm looking here in the numbers and ma- my, uh, the math I can do in my head is uh, telling me that's wrong. Um, so price to free cash flow, it looks incredibly cheap there. Uh, book value per share for this business. I wouldn't necessarily care about that, but the fact that meaning meaning typically I'd I'd expect it to trade at a premium. Okay. But the fact that it's trading nearly at book value is telling me something. So what is that that telling you, Fabio? What is that uh enlighten us and the audience? Enlighten it's telling me (laughs) this is really cheap. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's telling me that this is really, really, really cheap. Because I I I know that uh we calculate book value a little more conservatively than management would. And the yeah. fact that book value is trading just at the at the stock price is telling me just how cheap this company is trading for that. Mm-hmm. So this may actually be a uh, decent investment, maybe, maybe, okay. But just by that, because I know our book value is much more conservative than gap book value. We remove yeah. a lot of things, okay. We do. Like a lot of things that just basically rely on just management in essence. Like we, we really like not try to take management out, but for lack of a better term, try to remove things that are heavily influenced by management in our calculation of book value per share. Exactly. And then I'd ask, can you scroll down to the uh, um, activity ratios? For this business, this is actually going to be um, important. And you see Mm -hmm. there, uh, Austin, so in days accounts payable in cash conversion cycle, there there is the, the, the error that we had to fix the other day. It's showing up in this model. Okay. Yeah. So, so, but for those, for those, um, I can, I can kind of tell the audience whether or not those will be good or not, but, uh, the inventory turnover ratio is getting better. So that's a good sign. They're becoming more efficient in that, in that respect as a turnover, getting better, uh, accounts receivable turnover, getting better day sales, outstanding. It's getting better. So across the board, and then I can tell you that those last two metrics would have been getting better as well. Um, so across the board, Things are, things are improving. Uh, we kind of see 
that day sales of inventory has decreased and it's continuing to decrease. We want to see later on if that's going to continue or if that's going to stop because of the fluke year in 2020, because I see mm -hmm. it went from 59 to 53. That's quite drastic uh, of a change for, for a company. You have to look at it in percentage terms. So in percentage terms, that's pretty drastic. But it's, if it continues this way, that's a positive sign. All right, so from this, what I'm gathering is there's there's something here, okay? There's something here with this business. Uh, what I want to see now is go back to the summary page. And yeah, right there. So average buybacks over the past year. So it's averaged out about 7.19%. So actually put in some buybacks, say yes. Let's say they continue to do so. And let's be concerned and say two. So now I can assume that the decay. Mm hmm Okay, so if I can assume a decay of 2%, let's actually increase the decay because it's in a declining business. And let's actually up it to like five, five to 6%. Wow. <laughs> okay, so now I want you to take us to the, um, the uh, sheet where we can see the growth rate of revenues and cash flows and then how they're compared to one another in a graph. All right, so... Here, this is important. So we see that sales has been growing on the average by the four-year mark at 8.98%. And the reason why we do four years is because we're going back five years. So mm -hmm. we, we're, we need, we're calculating, obviously, based on four years uh, mm -hmm. because you're not going to calculate it in five years because we're only receiving five years. So you can't calculate that growth. Uh, and then on three years, we kind of see it getting closer. So th on the one year, we saw a jump in growth versus the three-year. And that tells me that in the past, there was one year that they grew a lot relative to, to now, okay? Because that's why it's pushing it up on an average of 8.98%. And that can be probably be reflected here on the, um, you can probably see that on the um, uh, chart. Yeah, you can see that at the very beginning, uh, it, it was. Uh, mm -hmm. So we want to see the cash flow from operations. Uh, that one's going up uh, 7%. So actually on the four year, Okay, you see that on the one year, it's down 22%. Okay, that's a negative sign. We want to make sure that that's not going to accelerate. If that's going yeah. to accelerate, that's why this is so cheap. Because go back to the summary, put a negative 10, put a negative 20%. There yeah. you go. Put a negative 10%. But now something else too, Fabio. There's still buys. Yes. Even at even at a 100% margin of safety here. Here's now the Assuming... problem. Go to the Altman Z score. I want to see that real quick. Where is this? Here. It's right there. Okay. So, oh, yeah. By the way, on, on this sheet, we, we kind of give everyone like a, a taste of how to use it. So I'll make us a little bit smaller so you can see. But that that's basically what what the measurement entails. So we're in a measurement of ambiguity or uncertainty. We don't know. Okay, so that's that's a sign, by the way. Uh, go to the um, summary tab. So Fabio, to kind of, um, before I move to the summary tab, would you explain for maybe some of our new viewers who might not know what the Alton score is, just a very basic overview. And then also too, the reason why this is such a good indicator for helping predict bankruptcy. Yeah, so the Altman Z-score is something that was designed or created to predict bankruptcy because it takes into account a bunch of different measures um, and then puts them all together in a weighted basis that then spits out a value. And this value basically tells us whether or not uh, a company is likely to be bankrupt. And it's about 97% accurate most of the time. So, But let me explain when it's not accurate. So First of all, it was mainly designed for uh, industrial companies, but it can be applicable to non-industrial companies too, but it was designed for them. So it predicted back in the day that AMD would go bankrupt. Remember that it's 97% accurate. There is a 3% mm -hmm. right, of the time that it's incorrect. right? And AMD was part of that 3%. So if you had purchased um, AMD while the Altman Z-score was predicting bankruptcy, one, you, you probably had a deeper understanding of the business beyond that of simply measuring the, the, the um, risks associated with credit and liquidity and stuff like that. You understood that 
for some reason, you understood that um, they were going to get past this and actually excel as a business going forward. So if you purchased then, your returns would have been ridiculous. You would have been buying it around $2 a share, $3 a share around there. Um, and you would be very wealthy today if you looked past the Almond Z score. But the Almond Z score is like a taste test. It doesn't tell you exactly. You, you want to, like Austin said, what, what he's been learning is investing is a multi-layered cake. So this is just one layer. We're just looking at it and we're saying, huh, okay, that's not that good. I need to do research on that. I need to make sure, right? And then if it's above that, like let's say if I see an Altman Z score of 11, I don't really have to be too scared, okay? That it's gonna go bankrupt within, and it, it says it there, uh, within the next couple of years, because it doesn't predict for the next 10 years, that's impossible, but it predicts within the next couple of years, whether or not it's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would tell me a very low probability of bankruptcy if I saw something of 11. Like if you saw Facebook's Altman Z score, you would see a very, very low probability of bankruptcy. And then you go and corroborate that with the balance sheet and you would see how much debt they have to compare to cash. And you'd say, okay, there's probably no way. So this tells me we have to look deeper at the balance sheet, which uh, I will actually pull up the liabilities section um, and show everyone kind of what we're looking at. So right here, we're looking at the company's, um, a screenshot of the company's liability liabilities. And what we can see here, is there anything that sticks out to you, Austin? We have what? Um, I see a lot of long-term debt, which we corroborated in their uh, solvency ratios. Yeah. I also see a, a pretty, I mean, the only thing that really actually sticks out to me is the long-term debt. Everything else is relatively even in terms of accounts payable, accrued liabilities, uh, the current portion of the debt outstanding, um, you know, et cetera, so forth. So really, it's just that debt that just stands out to me. Fabio. All right, let's 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 put a pin on that. Five point two billion in long term debt. Please share your screen again. Take us back to the model on the summary page. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to press the the um, the plus button down there. On the side, on the left hand side. Yep. This one. Yep. Click that and then show us the market cap. All right, what was the debt I told you? Five billion, 5.2 billion, something. <laughs> 5.2 billion. Take us to yeah. the Altman Z-score um, uh, sheet. Look at that Zero. average interest. 6%. Yep, take us right back to the summary. Remember that 6%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 6%. It's as if they're paying. Now, let's do a quick calculation, Austin. Let's do... Uh, you can select any cell you want. Select the cell that you would like to adjust, and then put it put it I, preferably above key stats so our audience can can witness it. Yeah. Cool. So then, just it's it, it's going to be this is some rough math, guys. Okay. So basically, I want you to do six percent, point oh six multiplied by uh, five thousand two hundred. No, five thousand two hundred. You'll see why. Now let it go. There we go. All right, so three, three, one, three, one, twelve. I want you to again mm -hmm. go on this uh, cell above that and do three, one, twelve divided by the market cap. Eight cents. All right. Well, it's not eight cents. Eight percent. Yeah. So yeah. If you rendered that as a percentage, that's seven point five five percent. Yeah. Yep. That's the amount that they're paying based off their market cap. Okay, in terms of interest, and mm -hmm. that's telling me. Okay, that this company probably has a not so good credit rating because right now interest rates are really low. I think junk bonds are trading around there. Okay, off the top of my head, junk bonds are trading around there or just above eight uh, percent. So uh, that's that's not good. That tells me there are some there might be some skeletons in here for them to get a credit rating that that low. Okay. Well. Um, my 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 next question too, if you can share your screen again, I want to see exactly where this debt is coming from, Fabio. If you kind of are getting where my thoughts are coming from here, and okay, well, so. the debt is in the long term long term debt, but there's a there's another thing. So part of that uh, you got to see is the current portion. Yeah. 
So I was, I, I had been wondering where my mind had just jumped right there was, I was wondering if they were issuing preferred shares, but I see here that they're not issuing preferred no. shares. So, so do you see a danger here? Look, look at that long-term debt, right? Mm -hmm. Look at that current portion. Hmm. By the way, we only took the interest rate off of the, the just the long-term debt, not the current portion of the long-term debt. All right, Austin, here's a problem, all right, for maybe the audience, the audience when we ask these questions, because we're, we're trying to get also you guys to think with us, right? Uh, so current, current portion of long-term debt, right? That's the money that they have to pay now, like this year, okay? So that's nearly $2 billion. For the sake of it, let's round it to $2 billion, because it's, it's just there. All right, so what is that market cap again, Austin? It's $4 billion. So Half of the company's in, market cap is due current, this year. Yeah, is in current liabilities. Half of the company's market cap is in current liabilities. Audience, this is raw, by the way. Yeah, this is raw. So you, so you see how we allowed the numbers to tell us the story. As investors, that, that's what you're basically doing. A good investor can get the story from the numbers, right? You, you analyze it. So accountants, and this is not at all picking on Austin. Austin has come a crazy long way, okay? So accountants typically make terrible investors. Austin is now no longer in that category at all. You cannot count him as among them, right? <laughs> By the way, so to the audience, no, Austin is not a bad investor. But accounts typically make bad investors because what, what happens is they, they die in the trenches and it, it makes them, and by the way, I'm not picking on accounts either. I have an accounting and finance background, okay? So yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've learned from both worlds. So basically, if you can't derive the story from the numbers, right, then you're not going to make, uh, you're not going to be able to basically derive the nuance and then be able to uh, correctly uh, discount the, the, the business in this case. So in this case, I'm looking here and the numbers are telling me a story. The numbers are telling me a story derived from a tremendous amount of liabilities that they've accrued over time, right? In the form of debt. And one of the majority of the majority of the times, the reason why companies go bankrupt is because of debt, right? Because those are debt, that's fixed obligations that are due in the future. So if we're looking here, the long-term debt is, large right but what we're not seeing right in the numbers initially is how much of that is in the current portion of long-term debt right and now austin can you take us to their to the model again and mm -hmm. take us to the uh data dump sheet i want to check out their cash pile you know something something else interesting too is this also colors my vision as well for why they're trading at book value here Father. yeah yes that yes. actually, yeah, no, no, like that, that actually completely colors my, my vision now, because if we didn't do this, if we didn't do a quasi deep dive into this right now, raw for all of you guys, I would have looked at this and I've been like, this is cheap. I mean, obviously I would have dug deeper, but I would have like seen that in a trading at book value. I would have seen that I could apply an exceptional margin of safety in my discount rate. And I could still assume pretty significant rates of decay. And it was still coming out as a buy, but like we always say at Capital Mindset, if things seem too good to be true, oftentimes they are. So now let's kind of move to the data dump sheet. We'll see. I'll here. present a question after Austin shows us the cash pile. One so go to second. the Yeah, zoom out for everyone so we can see it. Um, like that? Is that perfect? Good? All right. So cool. tell me the 2021, the trailing 12 months. Um, the cash and cash equivalents for the trailing 12 months is. 950 million, I would assume. Yeah, that's, that's, that's million there. All right, so 950 million. The current portion of long-term debt is about 2 billion. All right, it looks like they have a tremendous amount of cash that, oh, you can think they're, they're able to just invest that willy-nilly. Probably not, because if you look at the covenants of the debt, they are probably pretty strong, pretty strong covenants. A lot of people don't pay attention to covenants of debt. Okay, so Austin, think about it from the perspective of the market. Okay, you just kind of touched it a, a little bit. Maybe our audience might have touched it as well um, mm -hmm. when they're thinking about it. Book value, it's trading near book value. What is the market implying? The market is, correct me if, if, I am, if I am wrong here, but the market is basically implying that this company is quite literally cheap. 
that that the company's assets, its current its its cash pile is not currently enough to cover its debt. At least and, that's 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 where my mind would go with this. And what would occur in the instance of bankruptcy? Um, they would have to liquidate all of the assets to the debt holders to, to the creditors first. Whatever's left over is for the stockholders. Presumably the book value. Yes. That's why it's trading up book value. Because the market is implying bankruptcy. So mm. here's, your, here's your opportunity. This is for both us to think about and the audience. The opportunity here is if somehow you know this company will not go bankrupt. If you somehow know that, based on whatever research you're doing, right? This is to supplement that, but I'm, I'm basically guiding you through what the market's applying. The market is implying bankruptcy. That's why it's trading at book value, right? There's no free lunch in this world. So this the market is basically saying, this is gonna go bankrupt, so I will not pay that much more above book value. The book value being about, what was it? Like $9, $9 something, it's trading at $10 something. So there's yeah. a tiny little premium uh, above book value. And it's probably not going to move like that unless bankruptcy risk goes away. So if bankruptcy risk dissipates, then you can, this could be a very good investment, but that's an assumption. So somehow, you know, that this is interesting, but if you're uncertain about that, be very careful because that's what the market's pricing in. And there are reasons for that. We just, we just pointed out one without going too deep into it, but we just pointed out one just on the surface that current liabilities, we saw current, uh, current portion of long-term debt, very dangerous. About half of the, of the business. They do not have enough cash, which Austin, what does that mean? Well, you don't have enough cash to pay your debt. Like, let's say you have a mortgage. Well, that's a mortgage is a bad example because you won't be able to really necessarily do that. But let's say you had a debt, right? And you, uh, you have to pay it this month, right? You only have half of the money to pay off that debt. But let's say you have to pay that, that, that payment. You must pay that payment. Otherwise, they're, they're going to take everything from you. What are you more likely to do? What's your solution? Um, find any way you can to pay what, what you have to owe. Which usually entails? Issuing or, stock or issuing further debt. Issuing further debt. Refinancing. Yeah. So they're, they're yeah. going to try to refinance it. And maybe they're able to refinance it at favorable terms, but maybe not. And that's the unknown. So they don't have enough money to pay off that debt. They don't. And if we probably look at the cash flow portions, it might take up, and we have to find out how much cash they must maintain on the balance sheet. Okay, because that would be very dangerous. I'm making us really small for us to see it. Mm -hmm. Let me actually drag your, the screen that way. Um, so we're taking a look here and cash flow from operating activities, right? Cash flow from operations is about two billion. Um, so if that maintains itself or declines slightly, they should come out okay. But then that does also mean we don't know how much cash they must maintain on the balance sheet because that's has to do with covenants. And then we don't know uh, from there if this again will decay or if other problems will arise. But they're kind of operating on paycheck to paycheck. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm that's what I'm seeing here. So if they wanted to ease my mind, I would not be buying back shares at, at this moment, even though. Well, let me put an asterisk there. I, I would not be buying back shares unless you're you're actually the management understands that they're fully covered and the debt's not a problem. But I would be focusing on paying down that debt. That debt I would be focused on making sure I can just take that away because then I can remove covenants over time. Right. And then when I remove covenants over time, then I can uh, alleviate some capital because at the end of the day, if the capital can't come to me as an investor, this investment is worthless to me. So I want, I want to have less covenants because it's like restrictions on my money. It becomes less of my money and more of whoever controls it. So control matters. So the covenants are putting control on the capital, the presumably, because that's, that's, I guess, why they're, they're, they're holding such, such amounts of cash. Um, if they can pay down that debt, then all of a sudden they, they can give me more cash as an investor uh, in the form of buybacks or dividends. So I see, I would actually like them to buy back shares, but you see with that, that's where the asterisk, asterisk comes back. Uh, I want them to make sure that that debt's not a problem. 
So that's that's kind of where my mind's going with this. So basically, to summarize um, for our preliminary analysis of our subscriber request, uh, this company, if you somehow know that this company will not go bankrupt, then this could be perhaps one of uh, uh, a, an investment that could yield market beating returns by by quite a lot. Okay. Well, also, also too, if they correctly execute on the growing consumer movement towards direct to consumer, if they can structure their business in the way that they would be able to capitalize on that moving consumer preference, that too, and then also to mitigating the bankruptcy risk that I'm seeing here, Fabio, that too would also imply back, that this could potentially, yeah. Go back to the summary page. I want to show everyone. So go, go to the, uh, on the right-hand side, you see that plus at the top? Yep. So that will show our audience the calculator of what we're basically we're implying. Put a 40% discount rate again. All right, so basically scroll back to the, to the new calculator that popped up. So this is basically gonna tell us over 10 years uh, what the returns are, are uh, implying. Uh, so that, that's the level of market beating returns I'm saying if, if those assumptions all played out, okay? But again, this is, there's no free lunch. There's a tremendous amount of risk here. That's why, okay? That's why. So we kind of figured it out on a, on a quick uh, little snippet of the business what's going on there and then basically the 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 real research would have to be on the debt it looks like and then after the debt you understand the risks then you do the research on the uh business itself and how they're pivoting because if the risks are too great you avoid okay that's how i i take this so if i if i do a lot of research on on that debt and i figure out oh okay well that that's really risky there's a lot of things that have to go right on top of the operations because that's the position you really don't want to be in where they could execute perfectly on the operations but still suffer because of other things going on on the side with the debt all right so make sure you understand the risks then if you think the risks are not not that bad then you worry about operations and then should the operations uh do better over time if you figure that out then you think about uh adding it and then you think about position sizing because then there's the probability of you're wrong on both or one of them. So in this case, you got to be right on both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so Fabio, sort of a sort of a closing thought here is just kind of to summarize sort of a lesson that I've really gotten yeah. from here today. Because this this was raw, if I'm being honest with you. This was raw on camera for all of our audience to see. And that's basically if something looks too good to be true, more often than not, it is. Yes. If something looks too good to be true, more often than not, it literally is. And that's kind of why it's important to really make sure that you're doing the due diligence into these companies. That's why when you first hear about a stock, if you go on YouTube and you watch a video, five stocks to buy this month, and you get the ticker symbols, at least what I would do in that situation, Fabio, is I would be, if I found a stock that piqued my curiosity, I would then want to do a significant amount of due diligence before making my own investment decisions here. And this here is just sort of an illustration of the due diligence that we like to do here at Capital Mindset, because the way that we want to position ourselves at Capital Mindset is where you hear all of these stocks and you're excited, but then if you're smart, you come to where we are and we offer you maybe a different perspective that others might not be giving you. That's really like what we hope that we can offer here through the value of capital mindset itself. So now Fabio, do you have any closing thoughts before we end here today? Yeah, just to add, I mean, I think you covered everything. We're, we're never going to be a hype channel. That's not at all what we're going to uh, be focusing on uh, because we want to be here for the long term. And our purpose or our mission statement of starting this channel was to basically provide a space to share the knowledge we've accumulated over the years in both accounting and finance and give offer um, a different perspective. And you can kind of look to Austin and see his development over time. I mean, granted, his development is very rapid, okay, for someone <laughs> because yeah. he's basically um, he's basically jumping in, jumping into this and learning a lot all at once. And he has an accounting background, so he understands a lot of the the bedrock of what investing is, which is the yeah. financial statements. And when we, when we, uh, one of the things that inspired, especially Austin, is when he saw that there were individuals on the internet charging tremendous amounts of money in order to learn how to read these income statements. Uh, sorry, the um, 
the uh, financial balance sheet income, income yeah, statement, yeah. And cash, statement of cash flows. Uh, I, I, you know what, my bread? Yeah, that's when. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that's what my, where my where my brain went to because I'm remembering strong man. <laughs> yeah. How he makes fun of that individual. <laughs> and then, yeah. There you go. So if he if he watches this, uh, there you go. I said it now. The balance sheets. Yes, the balance. <laughs> <laughs> You want to, you want to pay me money to learn the balance sheets. <laughs> but anyway, we, we, uh, especially Austin was inspired by, by that. And, um, in fact, I think at one, at some point in our channel, we might do like a little mini series just for free. So you don't have to pay those guys <laughs> just, yeah. just for free. We might, we might do it and, and put it even on our website in an article format and a video format. But yeah, yeah we're never going to have uh, a focus on, on hype investing we're always going to try to bring it back, be a little more um, uh, realistic with our expectations. And because we want to be here for the long term and actually educate people, not, not just lead you on a path to tell you that, oh, yeah, you're going to get rich from stocks super quick, super easy. No, it's actually more difficult than you think. Yeah. And, and like even in that difficulty, though, the thing about it is that when I first started to invest myself, before I even had my accounting background, because for like a while, like I was kind of dipping here and there into the markets, you know, watching YouTube finance, et cetera. It was like a common mantra that all you had to do was invest. And then that, that you would just immediately become rich. And the thing about it is that investing a lot of people lose the game. And that's why it's important to make sure that you don't constantly surround yourself with yes men we always say that at this channel and it's so exceptionally important to not surround yourself with yes men because yes men will and it will basically lead you down the wrong path because you want contrary opinions to your own because that then expands your thinking you have to come into this with with an open mind and now the other thing that we also want to say too is that our capital mindset um, model that we have here and that we use extensively in our own business. We're currently in the process of getting that up on our website for you guys. And then the other thing too, that we are also doing as well is that we are actually probably going to release a series of videos that really kind of covers in depth because we see like a lot of comments with people talking exclusively about revenues and et cetera. And we're going to kind of come out with a series of videos that sort of walk through what we look for specifically when we're looking at financial statements, whether or not that's the balance sheet, 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 the balance sheet. No, 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 kidding. The, the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of other comprehensive income, um, the, cash, the statement of cash flows, et cetera, and so forth. So if you've liked what you've seen here today, please be sure to share our video. It really, really, really helps out our channel. Also, if you have a stock that you would like us to kind of analyze and go through the same process raw for you guys on YouTube here for you all to watch for free, then definitely go to our website at capitalmindset.org and submit it in the contact us form. Um, we're your hosts, Austin and Fabio. And if you've liked what you've seen here today, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and take care.